I find this time of year singularly beautiful. And it's more than any change in the weather, it's more than the cascades of colors of the golds and the reds that we see on the trees. But in this time of year, I'm struck by this profound sense, this profound wonder and anticipation. See, this is the time in which the world prepares for that singular, mysterious event, which marks the crucial turning point in the divine narrative of God's salvation history, the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is to this and other mysteries of Jesus' life which we will make reference in our course of study today. Now, our message this morning is unique in a variety of ways. Maybe there are some of you who saw the bulletin and thought, wow, what did I wake up to today? You know, <laughs> what, what am I in for? Uh, it's, it's going to be a different kind of sermon, but I, I really felt uh, led by God in the topic for today. Uh, I begin with my usual disclaimer that in assembling these ideas, I once again found myself just overwhelmed with the abundance of what was there. And this wealth of information housed by the scriptures, by the history of the church, all these examples. And I've tried my best to render these in a concise and accessible way, but I'll say from the outset that much of what I will say is not only very rich in content, there's a lot of scripture there, but uh, some of this might sound foreign even to Christian ears. It's not something we typically tend to emphasize, at least not today. So my encouragement to you is to take notes, to make references, to jot down questions and things you have, because I, in my experience, whenever I've done that with a sermon, it's been really so much of the work that God does with me is afterwards when I revisit it and I explore the scriptures and I say, what was this reference and how did this really capture me in that moment when I first heard it? So, all this being said, our key verse and our point of departure today, as you'll see on your bulletins, is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, in which Peter says, he's talking about God, of course, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. And it is to that particular clause that you may become partakers of the divine nature to which I wish to draw our attention this morning. You know, I would like us to pause over it and to really ponder what Peter could possibly be meaning by a statement as cryptic and strange as this. In working towards a solution, I believe it's important to consider what the apostle does not say in reference to the precious and great promises. He does not tell us simply that God will provide some external compensation in this life or in the next as a reward for faith. He does not merely tell us that if we believe, then we'll be permitted to live eternally. Now, no doubt these things are true in their own right, but Peter goes one step further. See, according to him, our inheritance, our end goal as Christians is to share in some way, in some way, with the divinity of God. Nor is Peter alone in this. The early church fathers, this is the post-apostolic generation that is all too often neglected by modern Christians, these church figures, their writings are just replete with these affirmations of this fact. And you can see some of them on the uh, PowerPoint behind me. I'm going to quote one of them. Yea, this is Clement of Alexandria. These are all bishops. These are central Christian figures. These are not fringe people. These are not people out at the edge trying to do their own kind of thing. He says, yea, I say, the word of God became a man so that you might learn from a man how to become a God. And you see these other statements too, statements from figures like St. Athanasius, from, uh, you have, again, I, I quoted Clement, you have uh, other figures, Maximus the Confessor is another one. These, these are all 
people who lived just after the time of Christ. And these are the people who established some of the orthodox beliefs, the Trinitarian beliefs that we hold as Christians. This is critical stuff. Nevertheless, I will not be offended if these words are beginning to prick the ears of some of you, or if you feel a red flag begin to emerge in the back of your minds. For wasn't this the original sin? That first terrible temptation in the garden? To eat of the fruit, and in so doing to become like God, knowing both good and evil? Now I agree with you, with those of you who feel this way, that this notion of mere human beings becoming in some sense divine would surely be the most blasphemous thing conceivable if it weren't for what Jesus did. So to begin to clarify what we mean here, let us turn to an interesting exchange between Christ and the Pharisees. This occurs in John chapter 10, Verses 33 through 36. This is the context. The Jews are accusing Jesus of blasphemy precisely because he's making himself equal with God. And it's Jesus' response that gives us a clue of how to understand ourselves. So the Jews answered him, this is verse 33, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, I said, you are God's? We're going to come back to that quote. If he, this is God, if, he, if God called them God's, to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? So Jesus uh, here is quoting, actually, the Psalms. Jesus does this fairly often. He does it when uh, he's giving up his life on the cross. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a quotation of Psalm 22. So uh, this is not unfamiliar to, to Jesus' method. So he's quoting Psalm 82, verses 6 and 7. And the full text of this reads, and this is God speaking in the context of this psalm. I said, you are God's. Sons of the Most High, all of you, nevertheless, like men you shall die and fall like any prince. This is very, very curious indeed. See, in defending his own deity to the Jews, Jesus makes reference to a passage in the Old Testament in which the people of Israel themselves are spoken of as gods. Basically, Jesus is saying that if God himself uses that language of his own people, how much more so is it right for Jesus to refer to himself as the Son of God? But here an important clarification needs to be made, and one which I hope will ease the tensions of some of you who are still worrying that this is a dangerous thought. And, I, and again, I don't uh, think that that's a bad impulse. Uh, it's, it's very easy to be uh, heretical. <laughs> there, there's a lot more ways to do something wrong than there are to do something right, particularly when you're talking about God. I want to emphasize because of this that neither the Gospels nor the early church believed that Christians literally, without caveat, full stop, become God in identity. See, now that would be a kind of pantheism, uh, it's totally foreign to Christian thought. We're not describing a view that we somehow merge with God, that we lose our own personality, and again, take on his identity. It's one theologian helpfully described what we're talking about as the gradual process by which a person is renewed and unified so completely with God that he becomes by grace what God is by nature. He becomes by grace what God is by nature. So we remain intrinsically separate in identity from God. We remain created beings and therefore fully dependent on God for our existence always and forever. But by grace, we achieve an intimacy with God shared by no other creatures. And why? Why just us? Well, the answer lies in the pivotal events of Jesus' life in his earthly ministry. So I'd like very briefly to highlight three events, and you'll see them in your bulletins, and I, I have um, 
uh, I study aesthetics in my master's program, so I always like pretty pictures. So some of these, I have some uh, lovely illustrations behind you that are, that are just very gorgeous paintings and, and artworks. Um, these events that I'm going to highlight have, a profound, have profound consequences for our understanding of not only God, but also of ourselves. The first is the incarnation of Christ. Um, you could say the birth of Jesus, although uh, the incarnation occurred before then um, <laughs> at, at the conception, um, but without getting too much in the weeds, uh, this is something we're preparing to celebrate in just over a month. Uh, we might be inclined to think, however, that the real lion's share of Christ's work on earth was done later, that his birth was a mere necessary prelude to his mature acts later in life. But I would disagree, and disagree very strongly. As benign and vulnerable a thing as the birth of a child might seem, this was an earth-shaking event which turned everything upside down. It turned it all upside down. It changed the course of history. I mean, we, we all reckon our time and our calendars according to this event. Because it was at this point that the divine nature took on our human nature to exist in the unity of one person. And that's how we speak about it. We speak about fully God and fully man, but one person. Again, there's a lot of ways to do that wrong, and the church had to spell this out over the course of many, many years. But fully God, fully man, one person. That captures the mystery of who Jesus is. It was Athanasius of Alexandria, who we already quoted uh, on the PowerPoint earlier, uh, captured the profound drama of the human state of affairs that was leading up to the incarnation. And I love the way he puts it. It's, it's like a, it's this very dramatic tragic kind of situation that, uh, that Christ is jumping into. He says on his work about the, the incarnation that the race of humans was perishing and the human being made rational and in the image was disappearing and the work made by God was being obliterated. And it was in the power of none other to turn the corruptible to incorruption, except the Savior himself, and that none other could create anew the likeness of God's image for men, except the image of the Father, and that none other could render the mortal immortal, save our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the life itself. It's just so beautiful and powerful and, and potent in those words. Athanasius weaves this narrative of impending doom, the destruction of all humanity, at the hands of human beings. We're going to destroy ourselves by our own hands. The world's tearing itself apart. But Jesus, in unifying our corrupted nature with his incorruptible divinity, not only arrested this process, but he reversed it. Paul captures this shift in our destiny in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is verses 46 through 48. Paul says, But it is not... The spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, a man of the dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of the dust, so also those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of the dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven." It's very interesting because the man of the dust, Adam, had the image of God. But Paul seems to be speaking of two different images here. I don't think he's saying that we, we, we're, we become something different than a human being. We still, we're still human. But that this original image of God is different from the new image that we have in Christ. See, in descending to us to take our nature, Christ changed us irrevocably. Yet so often as Christians, and it saddens me, we dilute and we soften this wild and untamable power of this claim. We say, we content ourselves with saying things like, well, we can be forgiven. We can uh, deal with sin. We can go to heaven after we die. As if our salvation only consisted in a reformed character and a changed life direction. But do we dwell on the deeper truth that accepting Christ involves nothing less than dying. 
Now I'll repeat that. You cannot know Jesus unless the person that you were born into this world as is killed. Why? Because the person you were is the person Christ took to the cross. It is the person who was nailed there. It is the person he took with him into the tomb. The first man is done away with. As 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 states, For our sake God made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, Christ took everything that was wrong in the world, everything that was broken in us, and he brought it with him into the grave to destroy it, to put an end to it, so that what rose out of it would be something the world had never seen before. Paul echoes this reality in Romans. You're just going to see the verses are going to start filtering out. Uh, Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 3, he says, he uses this exact language. He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's a powerful thing. In, in baptism, we're baptized into his death. Sometimes I think we want to have Jesus' light. We want to have all of the... Uh, all of the Nice sounding things without some of that stuff that sounds really painful. But it's this passage through death. Jesus did the, the hard work. He did the work that was impossible for us. But we have to follow him in that path through death to get back to life in a fundamentally transformed way. And I wonder how many of us are trying to cling to the vestiges of this old life with its worldly priorities and its focus on all things temporary I hope that these verses expose to our minds the utter powerlessness of the view which seeks to appropriate Christ, but on our terms. This view wants Jesus, but only as a moral guide, or only as a spiritual teacher, or as someone who can get you out of trouble when you really need it. And it is deadly treacherous, this view. For if you hold this view, then you aren't yet ready to go to the grave with Jesus, to follow him to the very end of your life, so that you can continue with him in his life. It's uh, Virgil's Aeneid. Virgil is an, uh, a famous classical poet. Uh, this, and this Aeneid is an ancient Roman poem. It tells the story of a king so cruel to his people, that he would punish his subjects by, this is, is a gruesome image, but um, uh, it's powerful, he would uh, chain a corpse to them, and he would make them walk around with this corpse chained to their body, so that after time, as the corpse festered and rotted, the disease and the sickness would spread from that corpse to the person themselves, and eventually killing them. So kind of a death-by-death death sort of scenario. Uh, very gruesome. It's a gruesome image. But in a terrible way, such are we when we refuse to die to ourselves. See, we're, we try to carry around this spiritual corpse of our former life, perhaps because it's familiar. It's all we've ever known up to this point. But you see, Christ put an end to the old man for good. Truth be told, the old man never had much chance anyway, but now that he's gone, the road is paved for us to become, as Paul says, the righteousness of God. We can become the righteousness of God. And this is not philosophical speculation. It is not wishful thinking. 
The vision of this glorious future has been given to us by our Lord Jesus Christ, whom the scriptures speak of as the first fruits. He's the first fruits. He's what comes in advance, what we can expect to see more of later. Consider for a moment his, Jesus' resurrected state. And again, we have a, a, few, more, uh, a few more paintings, a few more famous paintings of uh, Jesus' crucifixion and, and an interpretation of his resurrected state. He walks through walls. He disappears and reappears seemingly at will. At points, he is unrecognizable, even by his closest of disciples. There's something very, very different about him. And yet, he still bears the scars of his crucifixion on his hands and in his side. And at one point, he even eats fish. It's, it's not beneath the resurrected body of Christ to eat fish. And food is still good. Um, and when it came time for him to rise to heaven, to be with the Father, this is an event we call the Ascension, he did something, the importance of which I think we almost always gloss over as Christians. I think, again, we look at the ascension, we think, well, the work is done, Jesus is just going home, and uh, we need to focus more on these other pivotal events. But this important detail is that he kept his body. He retained his humanity. He took his humanity with him. One might think that, again, after becoming human, dying to atone for our sins, rising to conquer death, that his dealings with our human nature would have come to an end. That maybe he just would have left his body and ascended spiritually. But no, God had something infinitely more wondrous in mind. So briefly to recap, and I have a little graph of this. It may or may not be helpful um, to you. But we see in the incarnation the descent of God to unite his divine nature with our human nature in the person of Christ. Two natures, one person. In living a perfect life, Jesus took our humanity through the journey of obedience to God, which our ancestors, Adam and Eve, were always meant to have walked. And I've sometimes wondered that myself. So if Jesus just came here to die for our sins, then why did he need to be born? And why did he need to grow up? Why, did, why does the, Luke, the Gospel of Luke say that he grew in, in stature and in wisdom and in favor with men? Why did he do all that? Well, I think it's because he's tracing the journey of perfect obedience, the perfectly obedient life to God that Adam and Eve were always meant to have had but never took advantage of. So in his resurrection then, he leaves the corruptible aspect of his humanity in the grave. We speak of this by saying that death has died. And rising in glory, Jesus exposes our human nature to the fullness of his divinity, which had, prior to his death on the cross, been held back. Again, Jesus' resurrected body is different than his body before, not because it's a different God or something like that, but simply because Jesus was holding back the fullness of his power when, uh, prior to his death. And then lastly, in ascending to be with the Father, Jesus retains his humanity, and in so doing, he forever elevates us. And I think there's that very visual image of Jesus ascending into heaven, and with his humanity sent, uh, ascending into heaven. So what does this mean then at a practical level? Well, I think first it's significant to note that this signifies no mere return to the pre-fall state that Adam and Eve enjoyed in the garden. Now, while they participated, Adam and Eve, in a true, uninterrupted communion with God, by virtue of which they were kept from the pains of physical death as well as moral corruption, God did not share his nature with them. So their state of grace, it was a fundamentally different state of grace than the one in which we live now. Once more, Paul offers us a glimpse of how, in this life, we run through the process of embracing the divine intimacy given to us in Christ. He says in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, and I love this verse, he says, We all with an unveiled face, an unveiled face, the veil is taken away, beholding the glory of God, are transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So this beautiful process of this, the, the veil, the curtain of deceptions and lies and sin in our lives being, being ripped away and pulled away. And then 
in the simple act of beholding God, just see, seeing God for what, who God really is, you, we are transformed, and there's this step-by-step step from one degree of glory to another into that image. And I believe it's worthwhile to consider what such a claim would have meant in the ancient world, in the world in which Paul was writing. See, for the Greeks and the Romans, the gods, they were closer to people than you might think. They were closer to this world than you might think. They did dwell in heavens, which, while being beyond our daily reach, were nevertheless close enough for them to interact with us somewhat often. And that's what all these myths and these stories talk about, is the gods coming in and messing with our our business and uh, Zeus being, being Zeus and being promiscuous and, uh, you know, all these sorts of crazy kind of things that the gods do. Uh, so the gods were involved with our lives. They weren't way, way, way out there. They were up there, but, but close enough to, to deal with us. The gods were actually reckoned to be stars in the night sky. The, the mathematical patterns that the scar, stars took were taken to be a sign of intelligence, uh, and only an intelligent being would move in such a way. And also they're beautiful and they, they, they're shining. And our planets to this day, of course, retain the names of Venus, Jupiter, Mars, Mercury, and so on. And the Greeks and the Romans believed that in this life, if you achieved tremendous glory, perhaps if you were a, a Roman emperor who was successful in battle, who was, who was virtuous, who was loved by his people, then maybe, perhaps maybe, he, you could rise to the level of the gods and a new star would appear in the night sky. But this was certainly something rare and exceptional. So it's in the light of this cultural view that we see just how audacious the Christian message would have seemed in that, day and, in that day and age. I mean, the Christians believed that if you trusted Jesus, you weren't just going to the lower heavens, where the gods were kind of dealing with, where the stars and stuff were. You were going past the stars. You were going way, way, way out beyond to dwell with God himself, the source of all being, that thing that the philosophers maybe talked about as the, the heart of all being, the, the, initial, the first cause, that, that thing that is transcendent and above everything. That was above, well above the gods. And to think that even beggars and the uneducated had equal access to a position of dignity that not even a Caesar was guaranteed to, I mean, that was unheard of. To the culture of the day, Christians were claiming to make a spiritual leap into glory, which made the exploits of Hercules seem modest by comparison. And with this newfound glory that the Christians were boldly proclaiming, there comes a newfound authority as well. And we witness this, interestingly enough, a little taste of it, in our relationship to angels in the New Testament. Have any of you ever reflected on whenever angels seem to be talked about in the Old Testament, it's always this very intense kind of uh, moment where the angels erupt on the scene and they always have to tell the human beings, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't run away, you know, because everyone's always, uh, you know, <laughs> and then the angels say, don't be afraid, I ha I'm, this is why I'm here, and, but the human beings still don't understand what's going on, and, there's some, and the angels seem so powerful, and what, you know, what's going on? Like, the angels are here, and we're... We're definitely here. But in the New Testament, there's a shift. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, it's written, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have, crowned, uh, you have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. So, humanity is being spoken of and also the Son of Man, Jesus, is being spoken of. So, God made Jesus lower than the angels for a little while, i.e. human. Uh, and in taking our humanity with him, though, as he resides in glory, we actually witness a change in our status. So the angels used to be here and we were down here. But Jesus, who's, you know, my arms aren't big enough, uh, came down, grabbed a hold of us, 
and then took us with him up there. And you actually see this spoken of more specifically in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So Paul here is talking about Christians that have grievances against one another. So Christians that have some kind of legal dispute or something like that. And he's admonishing them. He's saying, because they would go to the secular authorities and they would say, oh, you sort it out for us. And Paul says, no, that's not the way to do it. But listen to his reasons. He says, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare to go uh, to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world. And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more then matters pertaining to this life? Now, did you catch that? We get to judge angels now. I mean, that's, that means our life today is a preparation grounds for this glorious future. We, as co-heirs with Christ, stand to inherit. By purifying our lives from sin, by embracing the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit, and accepting that nothing less than unity with God's divine nature, again, a unity that is prefigured in the person of Christ, awaits us at the end of the road, Imagine how different your life could be. And so we come to the final portion of the sermon with a reflection on precisely what those differences have looked like in some historical figures and can still look like for us. So we'll kind of do a chronology and we'll start in the Old Testament. So we'll start with Moses. So uh, Moses is on, we're going to find him on Mount Sinai. Exodus chapter 33. This is after the, the, Jews, the, Israel, uh, well, the Jews have been delivered from slavery in Egypt. They've crossed the Red Sea. Sea comes in behind them. Slavery is done with. Egypt, Pharaoh, everything like that is in the past. And now they're trying to accept their mission. So, God, so Moses goes on to Mount Sinai to get the tablets of the law, the Ten Commandments. And after he does that, he asks to see God's face. So Moses is kind of feeling, feeling bolder now. You know, he started out his, his mission with God saying, don't pick me because I stutter. And now he's saying, God, I want to see your face, by the way. Um, so definitely this progression you see there. But God replies to him saying, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And then the Lord continues, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So it's this, it's this image of several degrees of, of separation, where God says, there's a cleft in the rock, and I'll stick you into that cleft, and then if you kind of look at the rock, and I'm going to cover you with my hand, and then I'm going to, you know, keep covering my hand, and then, then I'm going to take my hand away, but I'm going to turn my back to you, and then maybe you can kind of glimpse and get a little tiny part of that. And that, and it's, the Bible says that what happened is when Moses came down, his face was still shining. In fact, his face shone so brightly that for a time he had to cover his face with a veil just to have some degree of normalcy with the people that were with him because it was so outstanding and so overwhelming. So fast forward now to the life of Jesus. And to one final event we're going to look at called, uh, it's known as the Transfiguration. Again, this is another one which we as Christians often gloss over. We don't usually talk about the Transfiguration as much, but I want us to notice the parallels between the Exodus account and this one. So in Mark chapter 9, this is in all three of the, well, the Synoptic Gospels, uh, but I'm taking the passage from Mark. It says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, so some of his closest disciples, and led them up high on a mountain by themselves. So there's a mountain coming back. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud and said, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Now, this scene is absolutely, absolutely amazing. He, we, here we have the whole Bible summed up in one event. The Old Testament, the law and the prophets, Moses and Elijah, point to Christ, the eternal Son come in the flesh. 
Jesus appears with the Holy Spirit, the cloud, and the Father, the voice of the Father, that's the Trinity. And through his incarnation, Jesus is joined to our humanity, and we see him glorifying it in himself, uniting us to God, fulfilling the purpose of our creation in Genesis. If you ever want to give someone the heart of the whole Bible, this Bible is too long to read, just point them to this, and it's a beautiful illustration for, for everything that's going on there. Because Jesus is fully human and fully God, now, unlike in the Old Testament, Moses, Elijah, and his disciples can look on him and behold his glory. It was impossible before. You couldn't look on God. You look on him and you die. But when God became a human being, a connection was made. A connection was made that allowed us to finally behold his glory in its fullness. And the history of Christianity just overflows with an abundance of accounts which show Christians who fully gave themselves over to this divine light. Nowhere else do we find purer examples of this than in the case of the martyrs. We only have time to consider one. I might have mentioned in the bulletin three different accounts. You can Google these. You can look these up. If they're in the bulletin, I mentioned, I think, Ignatius, uh, Polycarp, and... Uh, Perpetua. These are ones you can Google. These are uh, beautiful, beautiful accounts and very, very powerful. Um, but I want us to focus on the martyrdom of Polycarp. So uh, Polycarp was a bishop. He was a Christian bishop, so he, he led a church uh, in a place called Smyrna. And Polycarp is a very, very early figure. He was born in AD 69. So right around the time, this is still the apostolic generation, uh, right around the time when Paul and Peter were themselves martyred, and he died for his faith in AD 50, 155 at the age of 86 years old. So he was quite an, an old man at this point, which makes this account even more kind of wonderful. So we're just going to hit the major details of this, but I really do encourage you to read this on your own if you have the time. What makes this account interesting and why I chose it are the numerous ways in which the circumstances of Polycarp's death parallel those of Jesus. So firstly, Polycarp is betrayed by someone in his own household to the authorities. So the authorities come looking for him. There's a young boy in his house who gives him away. He is then interrogated by the Roman proconsul. And so there's this interrogation scene. And there's a beautiful rhetorical moment, and it's still captured fully even despite 2,000 years of history and difference, where the Roman proconsul says, look, just, just stop this foolishness, Polycarp. Respect your age. Uh, denounce... Um, you know, pray to Caesar, swear by the luck of Caesar, and denounce these atheists. He, he calls the Christians atheists because that's, that's what they were called by the Romans because by their perspective, the Christians were denying all the gods. The Romans had tons of gods, and the Christians only had this one guy who was kind of a guy and kind of a god, and they said, no, no, you're, you're atheists. You don't like the gods. So, <laughs> so they were called atheists in the early days. It was a polemic. And he says, denounce these atheists and, and come to your senses. And so Polycarp pauses and he says, this is, you want me to denounce the atheists? He says, okay, very well. And then he turns and he gestures to the Roman crowd and he says, down with the atheists. He says, away with the atheists. And he points to all, <laughs> all the Romans in the crowds. So he says, okay, you want me to deny the atheists? I'm gonna de I'll deny the atheists for you. And of course, the proconsul didn't like that very much. Um, <laughs> but I think it's just such a beautiful, it's, it's humorous in that, in that kind of context because he he's says, that's the only way I know how to, how to do it. I can't, I can't speak untruth. And uh, after that point, he's sentenced to death. He offers a prayer which is very similar in its structure to the prayer that the early church used before communion. It's very interesting. So before, like as we did this morning, taking the, the uh, bread and the cup, um, he prays uh, to God in a very similar kind of way. He's supposed to be burned, they were going to nail him to there. He says, you don't need to nail me. I'll stand here. And uh, he has this pyre uh, is lit. And the, but when the uh, pyre is lit, the flames, they bow outwards. They don't touch him. So the flames <laughs> form this kind of convex sort of shape. And it, they, he's not being burned. He's not being harmed. And it's very interesting what the Christians who were witnessing this in the audience say that they saw. He's described in this account, in that moment, as appearing as a bread that is baked, 
or as gold and silver glowing in a furnace. So Polycarp has this kind of radiance, and I think it's absolutely no accident that the imagery of bread is used here, precisely as the bread is the symbol and the representative and the token of Christ's body. Polycarp is described as looking like bread being baked in an oven. He's, he's getting closer to Christ this whole way. So the fire is not affecting him. So what happens is uh, the Romans see that. So a soldier comes up and stabs him in the side to finish him off, where we heard that before, and outpours enough blood to quench all the fire around him. So the entire fire is just extinguished totally by the blood that issues from Polycarp's side. And I think pi uh, fire as a sign of judgment, as a sign of condemnation, as a sign of, of, uh, uh, of death itself, is extinguished by the blood of Jesus, fully extinguished. So this imagery of the bread and, and, and the blood or the wines you can see, it's a really profound kind of thing. So at, at that point, Polycarp, uh, I mean, he's done some miraculous stuff so far, but Polycarp does finally die. He finally gives, gives his life. And what I want us to think about is that we don't just see here uh, an example of a virtuous man dying for his beliefs. In the narrative of Polycarp's death, the greatest display of love a person can show in this sacrifice, we witness him virtually becoming all that Christ was and is. His figures like Polycarp show us what a perfected sight of God looks like in this life. Now, theologians sometimes refer to this, this perfected sight, as the beatific vision. This is the unmediated, direct perception of God, the full glory of God. And again, Scripturally, this has good basis. We're reminded by Paul that we see now in a glass darkly or through a lens darkly, but then face to face. That's 1 Corinthians 13, 12. So to look on the total splendor of God is to become more completely attuned to his divinity. You can't get to that point and see God as he is without being changed from one degree of glory to another. And C.S. Lewis actually puts this brilliantly in his book, Mere Christianity. He talks about this. He says, the command, be, be ye perfect, is not idealistic gas, nor is it a command to do the impossible. He, God, is going to make us into creatures that can obey that command. He said in the Bible that we were gods. That's Psalm 82. And he is going to make good his words if we let him. For we can prevent him if we choose. He will make the feeblest and filthiest of us into a god or goddess, dazzling, radiant, immortal creature, pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine. A bright, stainless mirror which reflects back to God perfectly, although, of course, on a smaller scale, his own boundless power and delight and goodness. This process will be long and in parts very painful, but that is what we are in for. Nothing less. He meant what he said. So to draw to a close, in life, we give gifts to each other in accordance with our capacity. You can't give what you don't have. And we would undoubtedly be satisfied if the limitless God merely gave to us the gifts of forgiveness and peace, reconciliation with him. That would be more than we could ever fully hope to appreciate, let alone earn by our own efforts. But in Christ, God has given us himself. And miracle of miracles, given himself us. The God who became man has enabled humans to become, as Peter says, partakers in his divinity. Now, are we not just staggered and bewildered at the thought of that? But we can live it. We can live it. By the grace of God, we can live it. I feel, I feel convicted personally in the face of such a truth. I'm reminded of the pettiness that still resides in me, of the distractions which consume my time, 
and of the thoughts that should ascend to Him, but all too often remain below. So, let us pray for one another. You know, we're, we're gods in the making, and we hardly know it. Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we pray for the illumination of your Holy Spirit, Lord, into our lives, that what is inconceivable by human standards, what the, is foolishness to the world, we would perceive as the wisdom of God, and that we would see in that wisdom the mystery that lies at the heart of your salvation history, God, the heart of your Son coming to earth, not only to die for our sins, to conquer death, to, to forgive us, but to become what we are, to become fully human, so that human beings, Lord, that we can approach you, and as much as a created thing can become like you, to become you, to become what you are, God. Lord, we, we pray for the humility to uh, accept this. We pray for the courage to practice it, Lord, and encourage each other in that mission, Lord. We pray that we would not be bogged down by the trivial matters of the day, Lord, the ups and the downs and the unpredictable chances of this life, Lord. We pray that we would take advantage of our time, that we would uplift each other, and that we would shine the light of your full glory into the world in such a way as the world has never seen before. Amen.